Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be photographing a wild kestrel. We've been watching this bird now for about four weeks, so we're going to go through some of the process that we've used to be able to get a photograph. So we've come here today obviously to try and photograph Kestrel in the wild. How did you know, how did you choose to come here, how did you find here? Well I always walk around with a pair of binoculars and observe what's in firstly my local habitat before I start going further afield. Um, by doing that you get to know the birds and the animals that are around and when you identify one, such as the Kestrel we're going to take photographs of today, you also learn its individual habits, so where it likes to hunt and where it likes to perch. And after that you can work out which are the best locations for your photography in terms of the light and the background. This is the first in a series of videos and in this series we'll go into more detail about what to wear, what camera equipment to bring, how to find your location and how to take advantage of local knowledge in order to get the best wildlife photographs. Another couple of important things when you're doing wildlife photography is not to disturb the animals. That's the most important thing about wildlife photography. You don't want to frighten parents off a nest, that kind of thing. So being quiet is really important. Um, silent shutter mode on a camera is great, but just not bringing somebody too chatty. And with what you're wearing, try to avoid any bright colours, avoid your bright pink hat. You know, wear greens, greys, blacks, that kind of thing. In terms of equipment, we brought two quite different systems today. I've brought my Sony a7 III with the 100-400mm lens. I love this for wildlife photography. I can start with it on 100, find the animal in the frame, then zoom into it on 400 to make it bigger. I've brought Sony's a9 with the 600mm f4 prime lens. I can get better low light performance out of this lens than Heidi can. But conversely, it's much harder to find your subject in the frame and it's really heavy to start walking around with. Yeah, not for beginners. It's also important that you've got the right settings on your camera when you're doing wildlife photography. What settings do you recommend? Wildlife often moves and if the wildlife isn't moving, you move a little bit. So AI servo on a Canon or continuous autofocus on a Sony or similar on Nikon and Fuji um, is definitely the place to start because in one shot by the time the camera is acquired focus and you've pressed the button the chances are that either you've moved a little bit or the subject has moved a little bit and you wonder why your shot is just slightly out of focus. The second thing to look at is the focus area that you're using on your camera. In automatic mode most cameras default to using the whole frame for their autofocus and modern cameras will focus on the object in the frame that is closest. Now if you've got a bird sitting in a bush for example or the background is busy chances are it's not going to focus on your subject. So by using the smallest focal point that is practical for your subject ensures that just the area that you want is in focus and not any random part of the frame. For birds for example make sure that the head is in focus and if your camera has animal eye autofocus that helps greatly because it means that the real part of the subject that you want sharp is usually the bit that is sharp. The two camera settings to particularly take notice of are the aperture 
um, and a low aperture helps to separate your subject from the background. Uh, in Heidi's case that would be f5.6, for me it's f4, mm -hmm. which has the added benefit of letting more light into the lens. And the shutter speed, if you have a low shutter speed then either movement from the camera or movement of the subject will result in a blurry image and there's nothing you can do to rescue that. So make sure your shutter speed is high enough even if that means pushing up the ISO to begin with. And a general rule of thumb in a camera that doesn't have IBIS or lens stabilisation is that your shutter speed should be around equal to the focal length of your lens. So if you're at 400 millimetres, for example, you should be using one four hundredth of a second. At least that's what I use as a guide. Okay. And I think my last tip is that it's more important, at least to begin with, to get the photograph than it is to worry about things like your ISO. Once you have a photograph, especially if it's a rare species that you might not have seen before, then you can take time with your ISO and your camera settings because you have the luxury. But until that happens, let the camera take control, at least so that you have a sharp shot when you get home. Yeah, good tip. So we've spotted the kestrel up in a tree. Now this isn't the best photograph of a kestrel, but this is a good record shot. It proves that I've seen the bird, which is especially important if it's rare, but it means that I'm gonna go home with a photograph of a kestrel rather than nothing at all. And now it's really important to stay quite still and quiet. I've got a good record shot of the bird. I'm going to work on getting a better position in terms of photography. There is a hill just to the right of where the bird is sitting and I'm sure if I go up that hill it'll be a much better view and a better background. What I try to do is avoid shooting upwards at birds. It's much better if you can get a photograph on their level. So really quietly I'm going to work my way round and try and get on a level with it. Kestrels can be quite bold but you don't want to stand out in the open if you can help it. So I'm using this tree as cover, especially as it's a similar colour to the coat that I'm wearing. Just getting a little bit of warm autumn sunlight, it's very grey behind me, but just in the distance the light is starting to break. And if we can just get a little bit of colour on the kestrel that would help this photograph. I've tried as much as I can to line myself up with a clean background so that there isn't anything particularly distracting behind the bird. It also helps to have an f4 lens in this sort of situation, but even with an f5.6 there's plenty of separation between the subject and the background. I think the next thing to do is probably to switch from the monopod, which has really given me a lot of opportunity in terms of freedom of movement to a tripod which is going to be a lot harder to use but kestrels tend to perch for a little while and I'll be able to lower the shutter speed of the camera and therefore the ISO will go down and the shot will be a little bit cleaner.
we found a location to sit that enables us to watch one of the perches that the Kestrel uses a lot. And the advantage of this location is that there is a bush behind us that breaks up our outline and hopefully will also mean that I'd be able to get the tripod out and sit for a little while in the hope that the Kestrel lands on that branch. Kestrels are often associated with eating mice on the sides of motorways. Actually this Kestrel and others have got quite a varied diet. This one at the moment is hunting for worms and it wants the leaf litter on the floor. So I want to try and get low down and see if I can get a shot of that now. So we've moved our location a little bit and now I've got the A9 mounted on a tripod and I'm firing the shutter with this little remote release which enables me to keep the camera perfectly still and it's also on silent mode so there's no shutter movement. As a result I can lower my ISO and lower my shutter speed a little bit so the end result is going to be a cleaner image. I prefer to handhold it. Um, my camera's a lot lighter than Stuart's because of the um, smaller lens. I just find it easier, a bit more mobile. Kestrel that we've been watching for the last few weeks tends to sit longer on the same perches when the light starts to fade in the afternoon and the early evening. So we've come to our final location today and we're hoping that it's going to sit on the end of a stone wall that we've been watching for about half an hour now. It's always better with the nature photography if you can predict where the animal's going to be and get there ahead of time. That's always so much better for it than trying to chase the wildlife. So, fingers crossed. Oh, bye. Bye, thank you. That was really exciting. Yeah, it's always a privilege when wildlife comes close and sits on a perch that you were hoping they would. Um, and being so close to a wild female kestrel is always an amazing experience. Yeah, that was incredible. All that planning paid off. Yes. We hope you've enjoyed today's video the first in a series, we're going to be telling you a little bit more over the coming weeks about how to choose your clothing, how to find your location, um, which camera equipment to use and a bit more of an in-depth look at the settings. But until then, 
please like and subscribe because it really helps the channel as it begins to grow. And we hope to see you somewhere soon.